Welcome to Masala Podcast Live. Give me a big cheer. So the whole theme of today is the bad beti takeover. We've all been bad betis. We've kind of refused to do as we were told and not towed the line and been beisharam and all the rest of it. Let's start by each of you maybe telling me about your own bad beti journey. Raga, should we start with you? My journey has always been to be a good beti. And I ended up being a bad beti, no matter how good I was. It took me 50 years to finally accept I'm not going to change. So I first, of course, was born in a uh, South Indian Mangalorean family. That's very important for you to know because I ended up marrying a North Indian, which is very bad in India, not done. (laughs) Then I decided after I was married for a while that I had a seven-year rich and I decided that marriage was not working. And I told my husband, it is not working. That's pretty bad. And I decided to separate and uh, that was pretty bad. My mother said to me that, please pretend. Does your husband hit you? Does your husband drink? Does your husband not feed the family? Does he not look after you financially? Does he abuse you? And all, to all the questions, I said, no, he's fine. Then pretend for the sake of the children. I said, no, I couldn't pretend. I, because there was something else happening for me as well. And that was quite bad. Because I had decided at that time that I was living a double life. And that my relationship with myself was quite uh, dubious. I was interested in women, and I was attracted to women, but at that time, family and uh, relationship that I had, I couldn't really uh, manage. So I got into a journey of uh, accepting myself first, and I'll tell the story later. And that is my journey of being bad, because coming out as a gay woman in, uh, you know, Indian family, is pretty terrible. It's scandalous. It's shameful. It is battamiz. It's Besharam life, and I lived that life, and I lived that life with pride. I'm the co-founder of Hanks, which is a sexual wellness brand designed with women in mind, and we have launched condoms and lubricants and vaginal health treatments. And I'm pretty sure I didn't dream of that career when I was a little child when they ask you, what do you want to do when you're older? Not a doctor, not a lawyer, not an engineer. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, much to my father's dismay that I wasn't a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer. But I did fall into uh, a finance career and I actually went into investment banking. So the natural progression for me was not then to go into condoms, but it happened and we spotted um, a real gap in the market for products designed with women in mind um, and to address women as well uh, in sexual wellness. So, yeah, it was... Um, It was pretty traumatic going back to my Bangladeshi Muslim family and telling them that I want to leave banking and start selling condoms Uh, (laughs) on Christmas Day of all days. So (laughs) Um, so I was born in what was called Bombay at the time, Mumbai, um, and then moved to Essex fairly quickly. So pretty much bred in Essex in a very, I would say, quite a white town where my mum was a local GP and she was also the family planning doctor of the town. So I was always very proud of her. She was very into women's rights. She used to do abortions. She used to prescribe contraception. And it was great, I really admired her, but I do remember being at school, girls would come up to me and say, I met your mum yesterday, and I knew what that meant. It meant they were having sex and they were trying to tell me. (laughs) And of course, my mum would never tell me which of my friends she saw as patients, but um, I was told that they'd met my mum and that was the way. So I was really inspired by her, she's a feminist. Um, So here I am, I'm a sexual health doctor, mainly doing HIV. I had a few experiences, um, so, Uh, I've been a patient as well, and I've had experiences as a patient where I've understood what it's been to be a brown woman, a woman of colour as a patient, not being believed by doctors or other healthcare professionals, what it's like not to have a voice as a patient. So that, for me, has really driven my activism about making sure that we make space for people who aren't often heard to have their voice, particularly in health. So that's me. (laughs) As I started to go into my profession as a psychologist, which really stemmed from seeing my family distressed, but we never spoke about it. Who, how many of us speak about when we see somebody's distressed? And it wasn't until I watched a uh, documentary about depression, which Dr. Raj Pasoord was actually hosting, and he, he kind of talked about depression at that time, and this was like back in the 90s, which goes to show how old I am. Um, 
And that was, that, that was my kind of point where I thought, actually, there's a word for the way people in my family and my community are expressing themselves. What I have been passionate about from a very young age is, forget that, we got to talk about this stuff because not only does it affect our community, it affects our future generations. And that's what I'm about. I'm a mom of two children um, who are six and eight, and I want them to live in a world where mental health is no longer a taboo. I want them to talk about the struggles that we each and every one of us face, and also to talk about what it feels like to be minoritized, to experience racial trauma, and to experience patriarchal trauma as well as South Asian women or South Asians in general. So that's what I'm here about, and that's why I'm a badass Betty. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the taboos, the things we're not allowed to talk about. So we don't talk about periods. We don't talk about mental health. We don't talk about our bodies. We don't talk about the menopause. There's so many, many, many things. And the big thing we don't talk about is S-E-X, sex. So, you know, India, where I come from, is like the well, second largest population, so everybody's at it. But apparently we don't do it. You know, that's how little we talk about it. So I remember as a child watching something on telly and you know, the, the couple would kiss and my parents would change the channel. And that happens a lot in a lot of South Asian families. So I want us to talk about sex and normalize talking about sex because we're all doing it and we're all a product of it. So why are we not talking about it? So I thought we'd play a little game called the Gasm Guessing Game. <laughs> so the way it's gonna work is um, we'll play a sound and then I'll give you an option A and option B. <sighs> Is that a woman having an orgasm or drinking her favorite cocktail in her favorite bar? <laughs> <laughs> to the left, please. <laughs> to the right, please. <laughs> I started dating women in New Zealand that was quite bad because the Indian grapevine, it's the biggest grapevine in the world again, I tell you. And uh, the, my workplace got to know, my friends got to know, we were uh, ostracized. Uh, there was the Indian community there, which I have many incidents which were quite traumatic, where I was abused, I was spat on, I was kicked, I was called names, uh, things were thrown at me. It was just humiliating that entire experience, so I hid again, I hid in that closet. And I wrote a book called Untold Lies, and that's when I came out publicly. And that's when I decided that this was important for me because if there was even one person I could inspire to live their life of truth, that was enough. So I've always sort of had that resilience in me and I think having a mother who ha had multiple jobs in the 70s and 80s, probably the first Asian in York to wear trousers. She, she had a lot of better arm and, you know, people shunned her from the community. Why, you know, she should be at home with the kids. Why she sent her first daughter to a university that's outside of York. You know, so she had a lot of that. And I think she resonated probably with some of the battles that I would face then going on to start Hanks. So I think when we think about HIV, I think it's something that is very rarely talked about in the general population at all. Um, and I think for a lot of people, when you think about who's visible and the populations we think of with HIV, it's often men. We often think that HIV is something that affects gay men. Um, and it's very rare that we think about it affecting women. And actually, that's crazy because the, in terms of who, who's more likely to have HIV globally, it's women. Women make up the majority of people living with HIV around the world. And when we look at who they are, yes, the majority is in sub-Saharan Africa, but the second kind of most prevalent place for HIV is in India, in South Asia, and East Asia. So there are a lot of South Asian women living with HIV globally, and there's many in the UK as well, but these are people who you rarely see in HIV campaigns, in public health campaigns generally, and it's really about who do you get the information to, so how can you access information? And I think what you just said in terms of taking people out of sex ed education in schools is such an important point, because if people have access access to sex education, they can look after their sexual health, they can prevent getting things like HIV and other STIs. And often what we're seeing, and the more conversations I'm having with um, therapists who work in private practice, is there is a high proportion of South Asians accessing private therapy. Whereas when I was working in the NHS where therapy is free, I hardly saw anybody. And I'm, I currently live in Birmingham. Birmingham is a multicultural city. 
and I probably saw a handful of South Asian and black clients working, you know, that I worked with directly, which is a huge shame. And I think that there are various barriers, again, to that, which are around, you know, our understanding or our conceptualization of mental health. Uh, you know, you just spoke about sex. We don't talk about sex. Imagine talking about sexuality. That doesn't exist. As long as you don't talk about it, you don't live that life, you don't exist. In fact, I was told very early on that if this is the life you want to lead, just make sure that you are less gay. What have we done today? We've celebrated love. We celebrated being South Asian. I've decided to wear a sari at every podcast. Um, but I think what's more important is we've decided to celebrate being South Asian, but the bits that we want. And I think that's really, really important. So we've been told that to be South Asian, to be part of this culture, you do X, Y, and Z, and you don't do all the other things. But I think our learning is that we can choose. There are bits of the culture that we love. I love saris and jumkas and over-the-top jewelry. So that's what I choose. I choose not to have an arranged marriage or whatever each of those things. And that is a choice. And I think that's what I'd like us to celebrate most from today. Thank you for being part of the Bad Beatty Takeover today. Thank you. Besharam, Batamiz, Gandhi, Hi Hi, Bad Beatty.